So welcome folks to this week one lesson. So, so far you would have been introduced to the topic of, or the concept of de-risking. So de-risking is, um, is what it's all about, you know, and, and, and de-risking is what is gonna help you build a scalable business, a really successful business, a valuable business, um, but it's also a number one priority, not only because it's gonna enable you to build a business that's, that's more fun to run, more profitable um, all, for all of those reasons, but uh, if when the time comes, you, you wanna transition out of your business, de-risking it is what's gonna make it valuable. So the, the, the first uh, and most important thing that an interested party or like an investor, uh, a, a, a potential buyer is looking for is a business that is de-risked. What they're looking for is as few risks as possible. So your goal, you're pretty much your number one goal over, uh, well, certainly the next eight weeks and beyond is to eliminate as many risks as possible to your business. And that goes you know, right you know, through diversification, reducing dependencies, um, revenue spread, a whole range of things, you know, implementing the, the right kind of systems so that it would thrive uh, under different ownership, all of those kind of things. And that's what's going to make your business really, really valuable. So if you haven't had a chance to jump into the members area and check out the welcome video and that high level uh, overview of de-risking, don't stress because that's uh, this lesson, as I said, will be going straight into the members area. You'll be able to pick it up. You'll be able to go back and watch that kind of overview lesson and then dive further into this one. So what I wanna tackle in this lesson is a couple of those concepts that I introduced into that overview uh, and then really dive a little deeper on exactly how that I, I, um, I did those. So uh, we're, we're obviously called this D-Day, day one, of week one. And what I wanna look at is specifically the topic of how important it is to lock in your key staff, your key customers and your key suppliers, why that is so important and how that pretty much instantly boosts the value of your business and how you can do it. So like, you know, really, really effectively as well. So what I'm gonna do is show you uh, a few working examples. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to run you why as I'm doing now, but I'm going to show you a few of the documents and the resources and the things I did to do that. Because this is when I took my business to market, this was pretty much the most common or, or often the first question that I was ever asked when people expressed interest in the business. Well, tell me about your staff. Tell me about your customers. Tell me about your suppliers. What level of certainty have you got around the fact that they're going to be with you for the long uh, long term, and they're going to keep delivering. So I want to talk about that, how to best lock in these staff, customers and suppliers. And the other thing I want to do is um, really touch on the first big bunch of what I call got to have them value boosting uh, systems and processes. The, the ones that are going to really help you scale, the ones that are going to help make your life a hell of a lot easier, the ones that everyone's asking about uh, what well, everyone asks about when they first look at your business. Now, there's a really good chance that you've probably got uh, a, some of, a lot of these in some shape kind of implemented in your business already. But what you're looking for if you haven't is how to implement them. And if you have got them, how you can improve yours, how you can you know, get some, uh, you know, some, some really quick wins, some improvements to make yours more effective, more efficient and, and boost the value of your business. So the first thing that, uh, what I wanted to run through was a really simple sort of highly effective personal development plan is what I call it in my business. Uh, another word for it might be an incentive scheme. So well, before I, get, before I dive in, what I just want to say is this, that I'm going to show you a lot of stuff. And on some levels, it might be kind of overwhelming, um, but you can what i want to say is that you can all do it it is absolutely possible now when <laughs> i want to show you something if you can see this here is a big fat a4 diary okay that one says uh 2006 2007 i've got a second one here 2007 2008 now in this diary was effectively my business for four years i ran a business out of an A4 diary. This was my reservation system, my operation system. Everything that happened in my business was handwritten into an A4 diary. How embarrassing is that? I used to literally, 
at a time when I was starting my business, I was, I was running all the tours, I was doing reservations, inquiries, I was taking calls on the side of the road, I was you know, managing staff, I was trying to develop new products, everything. It was a complete, it was chaos. It was, frankly, it was horrible. <laughs> um, and, and, and it was unsustainable. And there were so many times I just wanted to throw, throw the towel in and go and do something else because uh, I, 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 just, I was overwhelmed, I was, I, I was lost and I just wanted to, to, to put that white flag up. But the time came, there was a few pennies dropped with me. One actually was a really great book I read by a guy called Michael E. Gerber, Al Gerber, called The E-Myth, all about systematization, so system I, um, systematizing, uh, implementing processes, all these kind of things. And it changed my life. And when the penny dropped, I started to figure it out myself. And I, I created, and I was not an, a techie guy or an ops guy, admin guy, I had a lot, really limited skill sets when it came to all this kind of stuff. But I was able to scale my business up when the penny dropped and I started building out all these systems and processes, scale it up fairly quickly to a business that was doing, um, you know, well over a million bucks in revenue and then quickly scaled it from a million to two million in just a couple of years based on the systems and, and the processes that I was able to build out. So that was, that was how it started. And when I, I my friends used to think I was, I used to get so much crap from my friends. I thought I was the biggest loser. Everywhere I went, I had a, an A4 diary tucked under my arm. I went to the pub or if I went to you know, any, any limited time I had up in that, in, in that period, I always had this diary with me. So um, if I can do it, you can do it. It is absolutely possible to achieve anything you want in, in, in your business. And of all the conversations that I have in my, uh, you know, we took with, with, with uh, micro business owners, both in my chosen field, tours and activities or any other niche in every, any other industry, the same problems exist they have you know it's always it always comes back to the same kind of struggles and challenges no structure inefficiencies loss of information when people walk out the door overwhelm lonely it's thankless doing everything things are taking too long uh, not having any fun anymore and so much of that comes back to the processes and the systems and uh, and getting things streamlined so without further ado uh, what I want to show you, first of all, is a way to keep your key staff tied into your business. So I just want to jump in and grab this document here. All right. So here, this is what I, I, I created. And it was really, really effective. And I did this for my, uh, as I started to grow, it started with my office assistant. Then it started with my um, business development manager, my you know, admin assistant, my general manager. As, as I grew everyone had this personal development plan. So this is an example of one that I created for my operations manager. And I'd encourage you to do the same. I'm gonna show you documents that I use and, and, and they might be a little bit overwhelming and a little bit detailed, but I'll just focus on the core elements and how you can implement them. So here's the really important things. If you're gonna create something for your, um, for, your, uh, for your team, so what you want at a minimum is create something that has both company-wide objectives over here and something that has role-specific objectives. So, uh, and you wanna, let's start with, you know, three, four, maybe five company-wide objectives. So the first one would be an obvious one, developing your vision, mission, your core values, your brand promises, and making sure that they are living and breathing them and adhering to them and be able to demonstrate how they're doing that. Second is communication. Um, now these ones are right across, the business, how your team members communicate with the other people in, uh, in, in the office, things like uh, workloads, individual tasks, um, and you might get specific, but anyway, and you may not choose communication. It's an example of one that I use, completion of tasks. Are they actually getting their job done? Are they actually showing up when they're supposed to show up? Um, all those things, continual improvement. Uh, they have a responsibility to identify efficiencies, and improvements right across the business and make recommendations or actually go ahead and make those improvements. And also financial targets. So there was a couple that I used uh, in my business. So had a minimum target, a stretch target, and sorry, a, a target, a stretch target, and then a minimum acceptable target. And so, so basically, and then what role specific would be related exactly like specifically to the role of that person. Okay, so I'm not gonna go deep into those, but what exactly does that person have to do. And um, you're gonna get a copy of this in the members area, by the way. So uh, the other ones might be 
uh, communication, accurate and timely communication within their specific to their role. An operations manager would need to be familiar with the, the products that they're um, piecing together and they should be successfully delivering their service. And that is things like guide training, um, you know, briefing, educating their guides, you know, getting feedback, all those kind of things. Um, presentation of vehicles. So whatever, the, at minimum, those two sections. Now, the way that it would work would be this. Um, when, when we review and when we meet, uh, which I'll show you how we do that in a second, you would have a, an employee that first of all, has an opportunity to rate themselves. So they give them a score, themselves a score out of 10, okay? So when you come to meet them, they've got their, their column filled out. You've got yours filled out as well, but you're not showing them that first of all. So they're, you're asking them to tell you what score they gave themselves and explain why, justify why they gave themselves that score out of 10, okay? And the reason we do that first is because it empowers people, it gives them buy-in, you know, buy uh, they feel like they're part, they're, they're listened to, they're valued, and, Let's say they've given themselves an eight, you've given them a six. Well, they get a chance to actually explain and rationalize their score. And that may change your, yours because you don't know everything that's going on in their lives, okay? Uh, so I've just seen something pop up in the chat and I'm, oh, that's good. So I can see the chat from here. Why wouldn't they give themselves all of a 10? Uh, I'll show you that in a second, good question. All right, so, um, Oh, that's great. So the chat pops up. Awesome. This is, this is all happening. It's all flying along beautifully. So, uh, because they've got to justify it. I'm going to show you how we score it in a second. Then so that might maybe change the way you actually score them. All right. So uh, it might, you may think, oh, yeah, I didn't consider that. Okay, that's a really good point. I'm going to change my score from a six to a seven. So anyway, we go through that. They uh, score themselves. You score them. And then, but remember, you, the, your score is the final one. Their score is, 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 is really, really helpful because it, it allows them to justify to you, but your score, the management score is final. So you, you base your score off your own personal opinion plus the reasoning or the case that they, um, they have to justify their scores. Okay, so that's how we do that. And there's a, a mid-year review, end of year review. You don't have to do it in such detail. Uh, you might do one review a year, it's totally up to you. You can use this in any way that you like. Um, and then uh, down here, there's actually a third section which you may or may not want to use. That's personal development objectives. So we wanted every person in our business to be taking steps to improve the way they did things. And it was the onus was on them. Whether it was a book that they wanted to read, whether it was a short course, whether it was a membership, whatever they uh, identified, you had to approve, you had a set budget for it, but they were taking some active steps to better themselves, okay? So they were trying to uh, show you what they were doing to do that, and you were doing the same thing. You That may be too advanced for you, that's fine. But anyway, that, that, was, that was valuable to us because we wanted people to be improving all the time. So here's the review schedule, just so they know there's no question marks about it. Quarter one, was a progress meeting, you know, just how you're going, just to check in. Quarter two was the mid-year review. Quarter three was another progress meeting. And then quarter four was the final end of year review, okay? So we asked them to, to prepare a week beforehand, which was clear, and this is how we scored it. Whoops. So we scored it like this. Um, uh, so one to two was poor. So basically it's a, the scoring was very, very hard. So let's say, a, a five or a six overall performance consistently meets and may occasionally exceed expectations, okay? So that's hard um, to do. So, you know, you find people are getting a lot of fives or sixes. Strong, a seven or an eight exceeds expectations, okay? So, you know, it's people, if they're giving themselves a 10, that's hard to really justify. So if they think they're exceeding uh, expectations, then they're in seven to eight, category. And then lastly, they need to know this. This is why they're doing it. Um, reward and recognition. So at the end of that uh, review, you could either choose to pay part bonus mid-year, part end of year. They get a chance to make 10% of their salary. So you calculate up all their scores and you, you crunch out a number. If their average score is a 5.5 over all categories, then they have a potential to make five and a half percent of their um, salary 
in, in, in bonus. So that's why they do it. And that was really, really effective. So uh, hold any questions till the end. So that, that, that was a way. And the great thing about this is you're wondering why we do it. First of all, it keeps people, uh, they, they feel like they're part of something that you believe in them, they're valued, they're motivated, they're incentivized, but also you structure these reviews uh, to review the, the period that is, has already gone by previously. So therefore, they're already into the next period of review by the time you do the review. And then the bonus is calculated and then the bonus might be paid a couple of weeks later. So all of a sudden, they're, they're a month or two months into the next period of review before they get their bonus. If they leave, then they, they relinquish all rights to their bonus, which means they're kind of tied to you in a way as well, okay? It's a little bit like a golden handshake. So again, you might structure that, but it's an added incentive to be loyal, to stick around, and, uh, and also it's highly incentivizing and motivating. So it worked really, really well for us and I'm sure it will work well. And again, it doesn't need to be as, uh, as detailed. So uh, if, if, unless there's any urgent questions, we'll just hold those uh, until the end and I'll jump straight in here. So guys, the next one that I wanted to cover was your customers. So your key customers, really, really important. And you know, it depends what type of business that you run. My business had a, a broad mix of direct business. So, you know, uh, ad hoc bits and pieces. Uh, and it also had a lot of really good distribution partners that were sending me a, a big, big chunks of business throughout the year. So uh, keeping your key customers loyal is, uh, is, is really, really important. So a couple of, like, let's just, okay, let's step away um, from a, a big distribution partner um, perspective for a minute. Now let's say you are, you run a cleaning company, okay? And you do residential cleans and you are doing, uh, you know, you've got a hundred clients on your books and they pay you by the, you know, by the, the the week every time you show up, you get cash. Well, it's 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 not a great business model, is it? Because you know they can they can just say, hey, not, don't don't bother coming back this week. You know, and 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 obviously there's no guarantees. You know, it's very hard to articulate the the value and provide you know to de-risk your business when you have no certainty over. And you can say, well, they all love me. They've been using me for ages, but it has no impact on them making a decision on that day, on that minute. But they don't want you anymore because they meet someone down the pub or at the cafe who's a cleaner who's five bucks cheaper and lives around the corner. So what do you do? And basically anything you can do to tie your key customers into you is incredibly valuable. So let's say, for example, you run a cleaning company and you start, you, you change your process whereby your customers buy a 10 pack of cleans at a reduced rate, 5% discount. And once they do that, however you structure it, whether you do this via email or via a booking system or, um, or via SMS or whatever it is, but you automatically charge their credit card, you, they have a consent form and they need to tick a box or acknowledge they need to, to notify you if they want to cancel uh, this arrangement because you will continue to charge them on a recurring basis when that 10 pack of cleans has expired. So that's that's a whole different uh, scenario, okay? And that is a really effective way of tying your key customers into you rather than doing one-off ad hoc cleans. So anyway, that's just, if you want a bit of a different context of how this could work in a different way. But I'm gonna show you what I did with my key customers to incentivize them to keep them uh, loyal and uh, motivated. So I'm hoping you can all see this now. What we did was um, created an incentive scheme. I'm just gonna move that up there. And so here's an exa example of it. So I just wanna run you through it. This is an example of an email that I, I, I sent to our key customer. Now, this is a customer that was uh, a travel partner that was sending us over $250,000 a year in booking. So basically 2015, 2016, I decided that I, you know, I'd wanted to do everything I could to keep them tied into me, they will continue to use us because the reality is any customer can just take off and go and do something else anytime they want. So if you've got a customer that's um, that's generating, you know, two hundred thousand dollars a year in bookings, if you've got a customer doing fifty thousand or depending on the size of your business, twenty thousand, ten thousand, whatever it is, you you want them to stick with you and you want to do everything you can 
for them to remain loyal. So, because when you, your business goes to market, when you transition out, someone says, wow, that's amazing, 250K a year, but hold on, are they gonna stay with you when, uh, when, when, when you walk out the door? Or what, what guarantee do I have that, that that account is gonna be with me when I, when I buy the business? So here's what we did. Uh, this is a steward, the owner of this company, Nicola is his uh, second in charge. And we created an incentive scheme whereby, you know, this is the, an email that was uh, created by my general manager, uh, Paul, and we decided we wanted to provide an override. So basically, any amount of revenue that they created for us over, over $100,000, we would pay them a 6% rebate on anything over that amount, okay? So, uh, so that, that, was the, that was the deal. And based on the previous year's figures, that we'd done, which was about 130, 140,000, so that would last year have equated to that much, okay? So we felt that they would do better in this coming year. So they had a potential to make, let's, you know, double that, you know, another, another three or $4,000. It was motivating. And we'd suggested to them, you know, why don't you put on an awesome staff event with the, with the money that you, you make from us, that rebate, which could be three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000, why don't you reward your staff with an epic staff, um, you know, staff event? So they were really happy about that. So that's what we did. So here we go. Um, the response was they would discuss it internally and come back to us. They came back and said they would be delighted to accept it and just to reconfirm in writing uh, everything that I I I've laid out to them. So that was the deal, six percent over a hundred k. Well, here we go. We didn't hear from them for a, a good number of months, and when we did, here was the result. So. We said 100K for 6%. Well, they did $245,000 in sales, equating to an $8,000 rebate. That's how motivated and incentivized they were to sell our products. So can you, can you get your head around that? That was, that was how awesome the, 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 um, the uh, incentive uh, arrangement that we recommended was. So I said to Nicola, that's really, really great news. And um, we'll run our numbers to make sure they all match up. Then I went back to him to talk about the next year. And what I did was say, well, we're going to have to uh, set the mark a little higher. So uh, not rather than 100K, we're going to do it off 170,000 and still offer that 6% override. And they came back to us, said they were really happy with that. And they hit 258,000 or something like that. So that's how well it works. And guess what? I showed this email to everyone who inquired about our business when we sold it, when they said, wow, that customer is a great one, 250K a year in sales. Have you got a contract with them? Have you got a guarantee? Um, and and you know, no, no customer sells, signs a contract with you. They just don't. Like, Why would I do that? I'm, what, you're saying I, I have to, to use your services? No, I'm not going to do that. But I showed people this. I'm like, oh, that's, that's done. Okay, no more questions asked. Fantastic. They're locked in. Clearly, they love you. Clearly, they will love working with you. Clearly, they're highly incentivized to uh to continue working with you so that's what we did that's what i would recommend doing with any of your customers so next uh i'm going to go back here and whoops next your suppliers now again this is a this is a tricky one but and i got the question a lot um which made me rethink the way I was doing things. And I had to, to really, really hustle and really do this very, very quickly. But the third one that people ask about is your suppliers, okay? Now, a business like mine, I was running a day tour business. I had a lot of different um, experiences that I ran, you know, maybe 20, 25 different types of tours and activities. So I had a lot of supplies. I had about 50 supplies, you know, wineries or, um, you know, kayak operators or, you um, <laughs> God, museum or museums or cafes or restaurants or so many different types of suppliers. And they would form such a core component of what I did, of, of, my, of my experiences. So I had the inevitable question, okay, so you're doing all these you know, great things. What about all the suppliers? Are they you know, locked into you? Are they gonna continue to use you? Are they gonna guarantee that they're gonna still be able to deliver uh, for you? Are they gonna guarantee the rates? That they're actually giving you because if they can't guarantee all these things then your products change your margins change and um your business is more risky okay remember we're trying to de-risk our business so i acknowledge that like it was something i'd never even considered and people kept asking about it. i was like wow they're 
so many things that people, because I thought people would just be asking about the numbers and about revenue, about profit, but it was all these kind of things. So I got on the front foot and I started one by one making sure that my suppliers uh, were as locked in as possible to me um, and which would give, which would make my business more valuable, make my business more profitable, make my business more, um, more stable and, um, and also make it hell of a lot more valuable. So the key with it is with your suppliers, because a lot of these suppliers you might use as small companies here and there, and they don't have any formal systems and structure in place, but whatever you can get in writing is immensely valuable. And something in that email that outlines the pricing that you have in place with them and the service they're delivering for you, the kind of inclusions that they're offering and what exactly those inclusions look like, really, really important. You know, if you're using a, if you run day tours and you're using a restaurant and they're doing a three course meal, entree, main and dessert with two, two glasses of matching wine, well, you don't want to know that they've scrapped their three course menus next week and they're only doing a two course for twice the price and um, because they're trying to phase out tour operators. You don't want that. You want um, certainty. That's that's really important. So, and also there's such a, you know, in so many industries, a turnover of staff, such a, such a, a strong turnover of staff. So what you have verbally in place with one person, that manager might walk out the door and, and then the next person coming has got an entirely different idea on how to make a business better. So you want something that you can put in front of them and say, well, look, we have this arrangement in place. Here's the deal. It's in writing. Boom. So anything you can do. So uh, important terms and conditions, you know, when they're operating, when they're not, opening hours, closing hours, anything like that. Date of rate and service review. Okay. So when are we going to sit down and talk about the rates and talk about the service and talk about anything uh, important like that? So we know that nothing's going to change until that date. And, um, and this helps you as you're building your business, targets for more favorable terms, okay? So what do I need to do um, for you so that you'll give me better rates, better conditions, better inclusions, all that kind of thing, okay? So uh, it's a really, really great way of improving your business, improving the quality, including, including improving the margins. Not saying, hey, I want more from you and I want you to charge me less, uh, you, you structure it in a different way. You go to them and you say, um, you may not be aware of this, but this is the business that we generated with you last year, 60,000 a year, whatever it was. Because sometimes people don't even know. They're like, oh, wow, I had no idea you were, doing, you were sending us so much business. That's fantastic. And so what you know, you're giving us is X. Well, what would it take for you to give us Y for, you, you, for that commission to be... Um, increase from 10% to 20% for those inclusions to be in, improved from da 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 to da da da. So getting all this in writing is immensely valuable. And I'll just show you how that, how that looked. Um, where are we? Let's have a look at this. So I uh, don't know if you can see that. I'm just going to try and increase the size of that a little. All right. So I thought I'd show you this, which, which would uh, illustrate. It's a copy of an email that I sent to one of their most important suppliers to solidify our long-term relationship. Again, all these things are going to be in the members area that you can use to refer back to and just to create your own versions. So this business was a business called Microflight. They ran these awesome luxury helicopter charters, like a Rolls-Royce fleet of, of, um, of uh, helicopters. So Rod was the general manager. So this is an example of an email I sent to him. Wanted to drop you a note regarding microflight charter rates you provided us. Um, now, when you're looking, you're talking something like charter flights of, of, of helicopters, well, you're talking massive margins. So if he increases his prices by 5%, well, a, a $10,000 charter is, you know, that's going to change the landscape a lot on, on your margins. So first of all, you want to get right to the point why you're emailing and, and attach something because um, as I say, big change of turnover of staff or some people might not remember the rates they give you. It depends how well the systems are working in their business. So that was, uh, that was important. Here's what we're, we're working with at the moment. Uh, first of all, uh, are you able to give me an idea what kind of commission level this approach to? I just want to get that in writing at the moment. You're getting X amount off, okay? Um, so it's there in writing, clear as day. So the next part, 
you've been doing some homework and you've reviewed uh, the way that your businesses have worked together and you've jumped from zero. This is, this is true. $80,000 in our first year that we, we, um, of business we sent them. So that was me, me saying to Rod, take a look at this. And Rod saying, wow, I had no idea you were doing that much. Let me have a look at our numbers. Yep, you're right. Holy moly, that's a, that's a really impressive account. So what I then did was this, considering that in our business, we're holding 63% more bookings across the business for this current financial year compared to last year. Pretty confident you're gonna see some big increases so get him excited what he can expect over the next uh, 12 months. So that's the thing is really important. Get him excited about what the future holds. This one, what do we need to do to get better rates? If I can get Rod to, to uh, increase his 10% commission on charter um, charter flights that we book to 15%, well, that's, that's a massive, massive chunk of change. And that goes straight to the bottom line of my business. And he might do that. He might say, well, yeah, absolutely. If you can increase to 100,000, I'll, I'll give you that that extra commission, it might be 2%, whatever. Um, and then this one here, I do know that a uh, member of my staff currently working on something else really exciting. So I wanted to get Rod exciting about something we've got in the pipeline that's gonna really benefit him. So I haven't got the, the response from Rod here to show you, I was just pulling through my archives, but what I wanted was a response from Rod saying something along the lines of, hey, Josh, so great working with you. So happy to see the increase in da 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 Yes, 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 here's what we'll do. Yes, this is, I can confirm. Something that when I eventually take my business to market, I put in front of someone says, oh, well, tell me about your suppliers. You know, um, what happens to your ultimate Great Ocean Road Tour with the helicopter if, if Microflight decides that they don't want to work with you anymore? I said, well, very good question. Here's how you don't need to worry about that question. So something like that, was really, really valuable. Okay, so moving along, uh, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen and we'll dive in to this next section here. So I wanna to touch on this today. Now, what I don't want you to do, and I'll be, I'll be mentioning this in the members area, I don't want people to get overwhelmed, okay? Because of what I what what I just showed you um, earlier is the way that, that I started, <clears throat> and I'm going to show you a lot of stuff, and I'm going to show you um, you know the exact stuff that I created <clears throat> that helped me scale pretty easily, you know, from 60, 60 grand a year to, to well over two million dollars a year, and I believe anyone can do it. I really, really do. Okay, so I had to create the systems myself. I had no idea. I just did what made sense, common sense prevailed. And I created this system where I, I, I instructed others to create these over time. So what, um, what I would suggest to everyone is that rather than get overwhelmed by all this stuff that you think you might have to create, just time block a period of time in every week to dedicate to creating systems and processes. So that might be one to two hours a week, just say on a Wednesday afternoon to two hours a week, I just focus on building these systems that Josh tells me are going to improve or increase the value of my business. So this is really interesting. When I took my business to market, and as I told you, I was, you know, or I thought about all the questions I would get from people about, uh, about the business, um, you know, the, all the things that, and I thought that'd be revenue related, sales related, marketing related, but most of the questions boiled down to these things. This is the stuff that everyone wanted to know about. And they wanted to know about the systems and the processes and what was going to make the business scalable. And of all those systems and processes, these are the ones that they specifically wanted to know about. So these are going to be in the members area. I just want to run through a few of these really, really quickly. Um, I'll just ask you, if, if you, have you guys got any questions at the moment that you'd like to, to ask me? Just, um, just let me know in the chat. If not, we'll dive into this section and then we'll have some questions at the end. So I'll just give you a second to, uh, just give me a yes or a no. And, okay, good for now. I've got questions, happy to ask later. Okay, that's great. Well, let's just continue on and um, yeah. So what I'll do first of all is, um, yeah, so 
share my screen again, and we'll have a quick look at the sales and marketing process that I used. And that one there, just to give you an example, and what, what I wanna stress here, guys, is that people wanna see this, but people get, um, you know, and it's so valuable for your business to have your sales and marketing process documented. But the, the, the important thing for you guys to know is that it, there's no magic formula. There's no like, gotta be looking this way. There doesn't have to be pretty in some little, you know, magic, you know, entrepreneurs template. Uh, it, it just needs to be simple and it needs to make sense. And the other thing that's really important to remember is the most effective and practical way to do this. Don't do it all yourself. Yes, okay, so I, I'm aware of the fact that some of you are one person sole traders. And of course, you'll, you'll have to start building these out by yourselves. But if you've got other people in your business, they should be doing these things either in conjunction with you or for you. So everyone, and then what they should be doing is taking control of their own um, the, the own things that the, the things that happen in there within their role. Okay. So if you've got an operations manager, well, you should not as the business owner be building out your operations manual, writing your processes and giving it to your operations manager. They should be doing that themselves. Okay. In consultation with you, but, but they should be doing that for, for two reasons. One is that as your business grows, you're going to become less across every element of it. And you're going to be employing people that are better that better at what at that at that role than you are. That's your aim. Okay, you don't want to be the best person at things in your business. You want people who do who do things better, smarter, more effectively than you. That's why you bring people into your business. So, people other people are going to be better placed to write these processes. Not only that, people feel valued. They feel like they're part of something. They feel like they're part of a team. They feel if if you're entrusting with them with with these really really important things. And on that level, on, well, on the next, it really weeds out the people you want in your business and the people that don't. Because what you should be doing, when people come into your business, they should be doing two things. One is their role, okay? Uh, what, what, what they're responsible for. And the second is documenting their role, okay? So it's hard to, 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 to do it um, retrospectively. So if you've got people working in your business and they're doing their job and having, you know, they're, they're getting things done and then you say, oh, hey, by the way, as of tomorrow, I'm going to get you to start going back and writing all the processes for doing your job. Although some will embrace it. Most will be like, well, that's a lot of work. Um, but if you get them, if you instill this in people from day one, do your job, document how you do your job. Do your job, document how you do your job. That is what's really, really valuable. Okay. Um, so it also, people will embrace it. They're the ones you want in your business. Other people will see it as real drag. They're, they're the ones you weed out. Okay, that's in my experience. So anyway, a bit of a, I'll, I'll run through this really, really quickly. Now, this is from all the way back in 2012, okay? Five years before I sold. So I'm not gonna run through every single boring detail. I don't wanna do death by document, but you'll get the, the sense. So first, it was all about the sales, direct inquiries. How to actually manage a direct inquiry from the get-go, okay? So where you find the rates and itineraries to, um, to, to add into, the inquiry, um, and exactly step by step process. And then an example, okay? So Kate's inquired to do a Great Ocean Road tour. There is the copy that we use to respond to the inquiry. There is the way it's presented. There is the copy there. And so it's, it's all there, literally the cut and paste for, for someone to use um, uh, really, really effectively to, to respond to that inquiry. So they could churn them out, a tailor-made inquiry, uh, in, in, a, in, in a minute or two. Then corporate inquiry is a little more complex because a lot of it's so tailor-made. So uh, I'm just gonna move that over there. It's kind of distracting me a little bit. So um, again, just running through the process. It doesn't need to be pretty. It just needs to make sense. And it needs to have every single step in the process. And there's nothing, there's no such thing as Captain Obvious, okay? So first do this, then do this, then find this here in this place. Nothing to simple no such thing as captain obvious so all the way down an example of what it looks like when you're actually creating the pricing where to find the spreadsheet for you to actually calculate that tailor-made how to how to in, in implement the margin uh and then how to create once they've converted how to create the booking form okay that's where to find it that's how to populate it that's what goes into it uh and then 
Uh, that's what it looks like the finished payment, uh, the, finished pro the, the finished document. Payment, how do you take payment? Literally step by step, how are you getting to zero? How do you create the, uh, the, the invoice, blah, blah, blah. Click approve, email to yourself before sending this off. Reporting, once you have dealt with the inquiry, it's either confirmed or it's been declined, whatever it is, it needs to go into a place that's reported. So you actually have some numbers to look at for conversion rates and things like that. So you report, that's how you report, that's where the data goes, that's exactly how you do it. Um, so back to uh, away from corporate to tailored quotes for agents. Well, that's exactly how it happens. That's where you find the spreadsheet with the rates. That's how you calculate the right rate. Um, the whole process is there. I'm not gonna go into the process because everyone's will look different, but it has every single step in the process, okay? And um, that's the way a corporate inquiry would look. Okay, again, you're going to get this in the members area to refer back to. And um, that's your booking form for a direct quote. That's the way it's presented. They're the terms and conditions. And that's the way it's sent up. And that's how you, fo that's how you follow up. And that's how you process payment. And that's how you report on these booking figures. And then a few marketing processes how to create blogs, how to create social media posts, how to post blogs, how to make an EDM for a blog. And so basically the object is this, someone walks into your business, your sales and marketing, whoever's responsible for sales and marketing in your business, now being a small business, there's gonna be a fluid business. It may not, you may not have a sales and marketing guy, you might have a general manager who has an additional role of sales and marketing. Well, if he gets, hit by a car, God, God forbid, or something happens, he walks out, you get someone in, somebody that in your team already, or you bring someone into your business and they say, well, so what am I supposed to do? How do I do my job? They're like, there's the operations, there's the, there's the systems, there's the processes, turn to page one, read it in detail, come back to me if you've got any questions, okay? That's how, that, 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 that would be your response. So people wanna see that. Next one I'll really quickly run you through is our, Training agreement. So training and recruitment, as I said, was another really, really key area. So I'm not gonna run you through every single nitty gritty detail, but just some of the key features. So here's the kind of stuff that you might consider having in your table of contents. So first of all, uh, it's, it's critical that everyone who comes in is living and breathing your vision, mission, um, core values, brand promises, all, all those kind of things. It's critical that they know what kind of documentation, you know, certifications or, or uh, you know, working with children's checks or whatever it is that they need to work in your business that they'll have to make sure they have and what documentation you're going to provide for them. Um, what your requirements of them, what you actually want them to be doing, how you want them to do it, what your expectations of behaviour, how they maintain vehicles and equipment, um, anything with related to being out on the roads, you know, roadside assistance or any in the event of a breakdown or things like that, receipts and reimbursements of expenses or kitty, and any sort of policies or procedures on social media or, or other important ones. So first and foremost, having in your training agreement, your vision, your mission, your core values, your brand promises, so important because this, uh, this document not only is for your core team members um, in your business, your, your full timers, but for, I used to have I, my contractors, my tour guides, my part time tour guides, my full time tour guides, the freelancers I brought in, everyone had to go through this. Okay. It was so important because one of the things that a lot of service businesses uh, suffer from, one of the things that they find really challenging is that in peak times, when things really heating up, they're gonna to have to, they're bringing in staff from all, 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 all over the place. So to, to enable them to cope with demand and the travel and tourism industry is obviously no different. So in peak times, we need to bring people in from, from more places. So um, there's a tendency, and I fell into this trap in the early days, I would find experts, qualified people to slot in and help me out. Let's call them tour guides, talking about a tour, uh, a tour or activity business. And what I would find is that I would say, oh, look, you know, they've got a CV. They've been doing this for 10 years. They know that region. They, did, they can do the job. Great. Get them in, wind them up, let them go. Well, I learned that often there was a breakdown in communication because they weren't 
representing you or me and my business, living and breathing my vision, mission, my brand promises, they were representing themselves. They thought they were the expert. They knew everything. And so they were representing themselves, not my business. So they all had to, to, to go through this process, make sure that they were doing things the MPT way. So that's really important. Documentation, um, again, as I said, the things that we require of them and the things that uh, they, they require of us. Now, I just want to point out, as we go through, I'm not going to go through again all, all of the requirements that, that, uh, that I had in here, but two really important things were that at every point they needed to initial each of the points below and they needed to sign off at the bottom, okay? So literally initial at every point and then at the bottom, they would sign off. At the bottom, they would say, I've read and I will ensure that these requirements are implemented. I understand that should I breach any of the provisions within these requirements, I'll be subject to action and uh, I will contact X staff member, who are my operations manager, my general manager, whoever it is, if any clarifications needed. So once they've initialed, once they've signed, they're locked away. They have to live and breathe this document because if anything goes off, off track and it will, as you grow, it inevitably will. There's no room, for, there's no wiggle room. There's no room for debate. There's no room for argument. Uh, we open that up. As you can see in section two, you've initialed point four and you've signed off at the bottom and you've completely gone against that. Um, there's no room for debate or argument. You are aware of it. And then you can decide what action to take. So it avoids and reduces all that back and forth, you know, debate, you know de de arguing the toss with, with, uh, with contractors, with, uh, you know, part-time, full-time uh, employees. So that was really the key features of this training agreement, training manual, you might call it. And again, it's going to differ in every type of business, but you could certainly use this for inspiration. You could literally drag and drop your own requirements into this document if you haven't already built one out and use this as your, uh, your initial um, document. These documents, they don't get started and finished. They're fluid. They get updated as you grow, as you evolve, as things change, as improvements made across your business, they'll continue to evolve. And, and grow. So getting them done in the simplest form is what's important, okay? It doesn't need to be a 20 page document. But it can be a, a two page document with a couple of points, five points with a couple of bullets for each, just to get it started is the key, okay? And once you do it, your business is gonna be better. It's gonna be more efficient, streamlined, uh, all of those things, it's gonna be more valuable. It's gonna instantly increase the value of your business. Next one. This was a big one that uh, we, we had um, regularly, regularly. So this is our roles and responsibilities document. Now I'm gonna move that down there. Okay, so I'm gonna try and explain this really quickly in the most effective way. So I, roles and responsibilities is so critical because so important that people in your business are crystal clear on what they have to do, but also what the people around them are doing, okay? It creates harmony and it creates alignment. And if you don't have it, it creates disharmony. It can create role confusion. People get pissed off and um, people have got um, false impressions of what other people around them are doing. If they're picking up the slack, all those kind of things, I'm just gonna have a drink of water. So roles and responsibilities. I believe that everything in, in, in pretty much every micro business can be broken down into these categories. So follow with me down the page. We've got sales, we've got marketing, we've got uh, operations, we've got products, human resources, accounts, and administration, okay? Now, don't worry about the size of this document. You can see here across the page here, I've got myself, I've got my general manager, travel and events designer, travel and events administrator, operations manager, and all the stuff that we outsource. Yours might have two columns. It might be you and your admin assistant. It doesn't matter. It could be you and your husband. It could be whatever it is. Um, once you get two people into a business, even if one of them is a part-time or outsourced solution, start, start this roles and responsibilities document, okay? So quite simply, I'll just point out the key features. What you do is in these sections, now I had two sections. I had Melbourne private tours, my kind of leisure high-end tours, 
and MPT corporate events. So you obviously, there's more detail in here than, than you will have, so don't be overwhelmed. But the key aspects of this are, 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 are as such. Let's have a look here. We've got travel and events designer, sales. So our, my travel and events designer was responsible for the sales process for direct uh, inquiries, okay? But this person here was also responsible for the sales process of direct inquiries. So in a small business, in a micro business, it's gonna be very fluid. There's gonna be lots of people who have a hand in certain tasks. Okay, that's cool, that's fine, it's understandable. It's really important that someone owns it, okay? So the person who ultimately owns that task has an asterisk next to them, okay? So those tasks go to the owner of the task, okay? And they are distributed to other people on a needs basis, okay? So the task is 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 um, attached to the travel and event designer role, but distributed on a needs basis to the travel and events administrator, and that is um, shown with an asterisk next to the owner, the ultimate owner of that task. Okay, so that is really all I, I want to show you about that document. But again, that's a big overwhelming one for many. You know, some, some businesses might have ten columns. Yours might have two, but get it started is uh, is is my because it's gonna it's gonna organize you and it's also gonna make your business more valuable. And the other thing people want to see is this an organizational chart, okay? And even it's so simple, but I couldn't tell you how many times someone said, "Well, tell me, have you have you got a, have you got an org chart in place?" And I'm like, oh, I'm like, well, I didn't, but I do now. Um, so really, really important. For you to get this in place as well it just makes you look more professional more streamlined more efficient more structured people love it okay so just get something like that in place so you can see there i as the director had the general manager reporting to me i also had all these outsource solutions who reported directly to me as well so that's that and uh what else have i got here oh the last one i just want to run through in this lesson and before we sign off is a risk assessment now it's and it's not very sexy is it it's pretty boring like a risk assessment um, you know why waste your time why spend your time doing something like this well it doesn't goes against my nature i'm a drive forward kind of guy i'm a build a business i'm a, I'm a you know open up more sales channels develop create more stuff i love creative i love i love the being in the thick of the action. So this is, it's not sexy it's, it's, and it's not exciting, but I couldn't begin to tell you how many people asked about it and how many people were impressed when we got one in place and whether that was the driving force to get those offers in eventually, gave, giving people the confidence that the business was professional, was systematized, scalable, de-risked, that it wasn't risky. And it just improves it just improves the appeal and the value of your business. So a couple of key things to do with this. And again, this um, your this this is, isn't actually mine. This is from a, a, a company that I thought had a particularly good one. And you can use it for inspiration for yours. Obviously, you've got the company details there, you've got the contents. Here's some of the examples of the categories that I would recommend that you add to yours. So general. Um, details about the equipment or the, or the vehicle, if you have equipment or vehicles or um, uh, something similar, what kind of risks that you, are in, you see in your business, and then some other stuff, you know, environmental policy, um, who's responsible, um, who the designated person is, how you train staff, and things like that. So um, the first thing there was that's important, if changes are made to the document, that people actually log those changes here. And um, so people know that, that there has been changes made. Uh, general uh, information about the company. Uh, some information about the equipment. It could be, a, you know, vessels if you're running cruises, or buses if you're running day tours, um, machinery if you're running, you know, a type of business that has machinery, whatever it is. Details about the um, the equipment, how it's operated, uh, whether if you own it or if you or, or if you lease it. Um, uh, really important stuff there if it's relevant to you. Now, risk assessment, why do you have it? Because it shows that you're really serious about safety, okay? It's really great for training. So um, here's what I would recommend is important. So you're just looking at activities and hazards 
the risk, what could go wrong, the safety control, what are you going to do to prevent it, how you check it's going to work, and who's responsible for doing that. Okay. So as an example, if you're running a river cruise company, so berthing when you're actually, you know, going into into um into port or leaving port, that's a potential activity and, and hazard there. So what could go wrong if you get a crushed finger? Um, what's the control? Well, there it is there. So training, supervision, first aid kit, uh, good housekeeping, um, blah, 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 blah. How do you see if it's working? Well, you check the number of incidents that have been logged and who's responsible. So you would be able to populate this based on unique circumstances to your business. And then there's some information about this, the environmental policy, uh, your owner's responsibilities. So who are the owners and uh, the designated people for various aspects of the business, how you train your staff. That's really, really important and really valuable to go into just an overview, not, not the actual training process, but, you know, um, yeah, a bit, a bit of a, like a high level overview of how you train your staff is really, really important just to know that the people have confidence that they're in safe hands and some procedures for operations. Yours would not need to be as detailed as this, but just a simple risk assessment that begins quite, quite simply with some company details and this section here on the hazards, the risks, the safety controls, the checks and the people responsible would be really, really great. And it's going <laughs> to the same thing, make your business less risky, make your business more valuable. So guys, that is where I'm going to leave it for today. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing and we can have some questions.